thank you. I'd like to welcome those of you that are here to this special day. I'd like to welcome those of you that are online. Uh, it, it, we're so glad that those of you that are online, but there is just something about being in the house of the Lord with the people of God w- worshiping together, and I'd like to encourage you uh, to join us. One of the things that I love about God's Word is that God's Word is so relevant, it is so practical to everyday life, our, our everyday life and struggle. Um, This morning, if you have your Bible, open to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to look at this old document that's over 2,000 years ago, written by the Apostle Paul. Um, He is in Rome. Um, And we're not going to spend time focusing on the gladiators or the Colosseum or the Emperor's Palace in Rome, but we're actually going to peer into a cold, damp, dark prison cell. And in that cold, damp, dark prison cell, we're going to find the Apostle Paul, an older guy. His hands and his feet are chained, and he is chained to a prison guard, probably a very crazy, wacky guy. I mean, he can't even suffer in silence. And he doesn't know whether he's going to live, and he doesn't know if he's going to die. He doesn't know the outcome. He's writing a letter to the Philippian church in Philippi, and we know that letter, it is called the letter of joy. Letter of joy. Written in prison, chained to a hand, handcuffed to another guard, and he's writing a letter of joy. Now, a few years ago, I preached chapters one and two. Today, we're gonna continue with Philippians chapter three. If you're new to the uh, Bible or or the church, if in the front of your Bible, if you have it, there's a table of contents. If you would take that, look for the book of Philippians, and then flip, it is in the New Testament. We're gonna read this amazing story that is so relevant, and I'm gonna take a topic that's this big and try to condense it in a very short amount of time, so give me grace. Um, And so on your mark, get set, let's go. All right, Philippians chapter three and verse 12. Now, Paul says, now 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 I, not that I have all, already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal. I haven't conquered this. I haven't mastered this. Not that I've already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on. Somebody say press on. That's right, he's gonna press on. Any athletes in the house, or former athletes, maybe when you were 10, okay? Yes, all right, so when you you are running a race, now we're gonna run the Spartan race. How many people are there? Several of us, they're gonna run the Spartan race in here, and there's a finish line. It's 20 obstacles in mud, climbing, picking up rocks, doing all kinds of really cool things. It's it's amazing, Uh, but there's a finish line. And this is what he's talking about. He said, not that I've already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on like an athlete. You're running a marathon. You want to press on to the finish line. He wants to press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. Verse 13, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But listen, pay attention. But this one thing I do, this one thing I do, what does he do? He forgets what's behind. He forgets what's behind so that he can strain towards what is ahead. He forgets what's behind, so that he can strain towards what is ahead. I press on like an athlete. I press on toward the goal to win the prize. There are prizes to be won. To win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Would you pray with me? Our Father in heaven, holy and awesome is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever and ever. Lord, speak through me this morning set some people free. God, I'm so excited. Some of, some of us in this room are gonna listen to your word and are gonna adjust our lives and we're gonna find freedom. Freedom. You're gonna change us. And so Lord, that's our prayer. God, we all wanna be different. Jesus, you're welcome in this house. God, we have open hands and open hearts because we wanna hear a word from God. Not a word from Eric, but a word from you. So Lord, do your work and have your way. For we ask this in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Paul says, this one thing I do. This one thing I do. I forget what's behind. I forget what's behind. Now, why does he write these words? 
Why, why does Paul have to talk about this idea that he has to forget his past? Now, we're gonna talk about that for a second because this is a huge issue in all of our lives, in all of our lives. Okay, let me kind of build the scene. Now, is, is, is anybody perfect in the room? Anybody perfect? Any, any perfect people in the room? Okay, it's, no, none of us are perfect, right? Um, we, we all make mistakes. We all sin. Every day we speak about 7,000 to 20,000 words. Do you think we might have an opportunity to say something wrong? Do you think we would have, out of 7,000 to 20,000 words, do you think we would have an opportunity to say words that we, if, if you say something in your anger, it'll be the greatest speech that you ever regret? If you type that email in your anger and you put those words in writing, it'll be the greatest words you ever regret. You let the words come out of your mouth and you're like, oh, no. In fact, I was talking with my wife a couple days ago and she said, remember when you said, and I was like, oh, can anybody relate? <laughs> let me chase a rabbit. So when that happens and your spouse says that to you, remember when you said, you know what you say? I'm sorry, would you forgive me? And then when she brings it up again, you know what you say? I'm sorry, would you forgive me? Hey, that's gold right there, baby. You just, I'm telling you, that will help your marriage so much. Don't defend, don't, def don't deny, don't, just, I am so sorry I said that. I'm so sorry that I did that. Would you forgive me? That will help you. That's, that's, that's gold right there. Some of you are gonna take that, and that's gonna help your marriage profoundly. Because I know, like you, you wanna defend and deny, and no, 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 I'm sorry, would you forgive me? That must have really hurt you. You're gonna own it. You're gonna own it. All right, so, um, so, so, so here's, you ever done something and you're like, I can't believe I did that. Any, can anybody relate? I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I said that. I can't believe the mess I just, I just humpty dumpty, okay? I just dropped him and there's pieces shattered all over the place. Can anybody relate? Am I the only one standing on the stage? No, we've all been there. None of us are Jesus. We have thousands of opportunities every single day to make a mess of things. And if we get triggered in our junk and we respond in our junk, I promise you, you will make a mess of things. And I will make a mess of things. And then we make these choices and we say, I can't believe I just did that. And we live with guilt, shame, and deep, deep regret. But oftentimes, we think, well, time will just heal all wounds. No, it won't. That's fairy tale stuff. You gotta deal with your junk. You gotta deal with it. The problem is we don't know how to deal with it. I made a mess of things, it's so messed up and jacked up, I don't even know what to do with this. Can anybody relate? So this is the Apostle Paul. And so the problem is because we don't know what to deal with our junk and the mess we just made, we just, we just move forward. I mean, who has time to deal with our junk? We got 100 things to do. We're running 100 miles an hour. So we don't. And now we're carrying a bunch of junk, like a boat anchor with a rope tied over it. And we're trying to move forward, but we got all this junk that we have never dealt with because we just think time will heal all wounds, and it will not. Yeah, things can calm down a little bit, but it doesn't address the issue. It's, it's, here's why this is so important. Okay. Um, some of you drove here this morning. Anybody drive here this morning? Yeah, yeah, great. Okay, you had a big windshield that you were looking forward. How would it go if you were trying to drive here and you spent all your time looking in the rear view mirror? This tiny, you got this big windshield, but instead of looking forward, you're looking at life in the, in the rear view mirror. If you're driving at 540 and you're primarily looking through, if you're driving and living through the windshield, through this little tiny rear view mirror, what's gonna happen? Well, you're probably gonna miss your turns. You're probably gonna get into an accident, which is gonna further complicate things. You're probably gonna be stressed out, 
and it's going to hinder your progress. And that's what happens when we don't deal with our past. Because we are living our life, driving, trying to move forward, when we have all this junk. And we spend our time looking backward because we don't know what to do with our junk. We just don't know. It hinders us. So the Apostle Paul is writing these words that are so important for us to hear, so relevant, and the Apostle Paul understands this tension. He understands what it's like to lay in the bed at night and look at the ceiling and think, I just can't believe what I just did. I wish I could erase the things that I have seen. I wish I could erase the things that I did. And some of you have had things done to you They were horrible, and I'm sorry, but there is freedom for that, and God doesn't want you to carry that another day. He just wants you to carry that anchor, that junk, that wounding. God doesn't want you to carry that anymore. So the Apostle Paul, you know what I love about the Bible is it's so real It is so practical, and it it is so relevant to every single one of us in this room. The Apostle Paul, the guy who writes a third of the New Testament, says this. Brothers and sisters, so he, he says this. So he says this. Brothers and sisters, I do not yet consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do. What is this one thing that Paul does? Paul says, the one thing I do is I forget what's behind Paul says, I forget what's behind. Does any, has anybody, anybody ever struggled with letting your past go? So you say, well, Eric, what did the apostle Paul have to let go of his past? So what did he struggle with? Well, let's look at the earlier verses. It'll tell us. So we're looking at verse 12. We're going to go back and we're going to look at the previous verse, verse 4. Paul's saying, he's saying, if someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. In other words, what Paul is saying, if anyone thinks you're really religious, I am way more religious than you. I have them beat. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel. I'm, I'm born in the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin was the tribe where kings, kings were born. So he's saying, I had the right parents. I had the right lineage. I was born from the tribe of kings, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. In other words, no one followed God's law better than me. I am the summa cum laude. I am the top of my class. And then the next verse, verse six. As for zeal, persecuting the church. As for righteousness based on the law, following the law, I'm faultless. Perfect. And what we notice in verse 6 is the Apostle Paul brings up and he mentions his greatest regret. He highlights his greatest shame, the guilt that he wished he could undo, the thing he did that probably kept him up at night, made him look at the ceiling and thought, how could I have done that? The Apostle Paul And you say, Eric, let's unpack this. Now, the Bible doesn't give incredible details, but there's enough for us to simply imagine what his life was like. Now, it says this in verse six, as for zeal, persecuting the church. Now, in the church of Jerusalem, in Acts chapter six, there's a Christian guy by the name of Stephen. Stephen, he's a good guy. In fact, he's a great guy. Stephen is a great guy. Acts chapter six, verse eight, it says, now Stephen, and notice the description of Stephen. He is a guy full of grace and he's full of power. Perform many great miracles, signs among the people. He's full of grace, but we're also going to see that he is full of truth. It sounds a lot like Jesus. Jesus was full of grace and love, and he's full of truth. He doesn't swing the pendulum from one side to another. And here's why you need both. Because truth that does not originate in love, listen to me, truth that does not originate in love, you know what it is? It is harsh and it is cruel. And listen to me, listen on the flip side. And grace, grace that is wimpy, unicorns in love. Okay, grace, grace that's all grace, but is spineless. Listen to me, it is meaningless and it leads people nowhere. 
That's why you need to be both. Jesus wasn't 50% grace, 50% truth. No, no, no. Jesus was 100% grace. He was the most loving person you've ever met with. He's also the most truthful person. He's gonna say things to you you have never heard and no one has ever been that, loved you enough to say these things to you, not in anger, but the truth. Stephen is a religious leader. He's full of love and grace. Okay, he's full of truth and grace. The religious leaders get into an argument with him. They oppose what he is saying, but, Acts 6.10, but these religious leaders, they could not stand against Stephen's wisdom or the spirit by which he spoke, Stephen spoke. They get into a religious debate with Stephen. Stephen doesn't shut down. He's full of grace and he's full of truth. They were so angry with him. Listen to this. They were so angry with him, they grab Stephen, throw him into the street, surround him, and they pick up stones. They're stoning him to death because he spoke the truth and they didn't want to hear it. His final words before he dies, listen to what, how he responds to people that are throwing stones at him. Stephen says this, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And then he dies. Do you extend grace to people that hurt you? Do you extend grace to the people that hurt you? It sounds a lot like Jesus, doesn't it? Jesus is on the cross. They're literally crucifying Jesus until death. And what does Jesus say? Jesus says, Father, what? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Okay, according to other passages in the Bible, like Act 20, 22, Stephen is probably, the person that gave the orders for Stephen to be stoned to death was probably the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul probably was the one that said, kill him. Apostle Paul. He had that image in his mind. He saw that happen. And he probably just didn't see it. He probably gave the orders. Do you think he would struggle with his past? Does he have a past? Does, does Paul have a past? Absolutely. Listen to what he says in 1 Corinthians. Has, has anybody ever thought this idea? I'm just unworthy to be in this house. I'm unworthy to go to church. I don't deserve to go to church. Okay, don't raise your hand. Okay, you get the, you get the point. Okay, so you get the point. I just don't feel worthy enough to be, because church is full of a bunch of perfect people, and I'm not perfect because I know my crap, and I know my junk. We're all jacked up. We just dress up nice. Newsflash. We can pretend if you want, but let's just call a spade a spade. That's why we need Jesus. That's why we need Jesus. Okay, what does Paul say, 1 Corinthians 15? Paul says, listen to what Paul's words. So I said, Do you, does anyone ever feel undeserving? The writer of a third of the New Testament, listen to these words. Paul says, I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle. I don't even think I'm worthy to be called an apostle. This is the guy that wrote a third of the New Testament. I don't think I'm worthy to be called an apostle. Why? Because I persecuted the church. So does, does the apostle Paul have a past that he has to deal with? Yes. Yes. That's why he writes these words. And brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but this one thing I do. I've got to forget the past. In order for you to move forward, you have to deal with your past. In order for me to move forward, I have to deal with my past. It's like trying to look through my glasses when my glasses are covered with a bunch of sludge and dirt. I've got to get cleaned up first so that I can see the future. This one thing I do, forget what's behind and straining towards what is ahead. Now, in this passage, Paul is highlighting, surfacing his deepest, darkest regrets. The thing he wants to hide. But he had an encounter with Jesus and he recognized that God wants to forgive him of that and that he doesn't have to carry that weight and that sin on his shoulders and that's the same for you. You don't have to carry your shame anymore. God is not glorified that you carry your sin and your shame. God is not like, 
man, that was so bad, you're gonna carry that to the day you die. That's not Jesus. That's, that's, that's the liar. That's your enemy who is a liar, liar who wants to whisper to you, you're not worthy. No, we're not, but Jesus is. And he wants to forgive you and he wants to set you free. So why is it important? Why is it important that I deal with my past? Why is it important? Because when we live life without dealing with our past, but who has time to deal with our past, right? All the stress, pressure, we have so much on us, we're always trying to move forward, but, but we're, we're moving forward with this rope tied to an anchor that is dragging us back, that is holding us back. See, we can be so fixated on that rear view mirror looking backward that it, that it hinders us from really moving forward. In fact, our skeletons keep us paralyzed and under constant condemnation and constant, under constant shame. And the Apostle Paul refused to live hindered or consumed by his past. So let me ask you a question. What in your past is holding you back? What in your past, what is that thing that you wanna hide? What is that thing that you never wanna talk about? What is that that issue that you hope doesn't ever come up in conversation because every time it comes up, you get triggered because you feel so much shame and you feel so much guilt and you don't even know what to do with it. What is the thing, what thing in your past is continuing to haunt you? Listen to me, here's, here's a question I gotta ask you. Hey, I love you. Here's the question I wanna ask you. How far into your future do you wanna carry your past? Six months, a year? How far into your future do you wanna continue to carry that junk? A year, two years? Do you have to do time? And if you have to do time, how much time? How long? How far? How far into your future do you continue to ignore the thing that God keeps bringing up because he wants to set you free from it? Warning, it's the, it's, it's the dashboard. Warning, warning, warning. Every time this topic comes up, I feel so much shame and guilt and remorse. It's because Jesus wants to set you free. Listen to me, you have a race to run. You have a race to run. And are you sitting on the sidelines because of what was done to you and because of what you have done? Basically, because of your past. But here's, here's what's so important, Eric. Here's what's so important. How do we make sure that next time really is different? How do I make sure next time is different? How do I make sure that I don't repeat the mistakes of my past? Because you can let it go, but if you haven't dealt with your part of it, it's gonna to continue to repeat itself. Got it? So how do we do this? Number two, here's what you're gonna do. What you're gonna do. In order for you, to, you and I to deal with our past, you have to own your part. Somebody say own it. Own it. One more time. Own it. Nobody likes to own our junk. This is so hard for us. This is so hard for me. This is so hard for us to do. We can sit in here and we can say, yeah, just own it and, and I'm humble. We can make great boast, but are we really? Uh, think of this. I want you to think about this for a second. The very first thing, the very first thing that the first people did, Adam and Eve, that were closest to perfection, they blew it up big time, okay? They messed up big time and it impacted every single one of us. What was the first thing that the first people did after they blew things up and made a big mess and dropped Humpty Dumpty in the million, million, million pieces all, do you know what they did? They blamed. But listen to me, you cannot blame your way into a better future. You cannot blame your way into a better future. This is so hard for us. This is so hard for us. Why is this hard for us? Okay, Adam and Eve are in the garden. God gives them one rule. Okay, they're naked, unashamed, and afraid. They had an amazing sex life. Yes, I did say sex. Sex is okay. Society has taken something beautiful that God made that is healthy and good and right and made it bad. It is not bad, it is good. It's a lot of fun. You should, if you're married, you should try it, often. <laughs> and I gotta keep going or I'm gonna get in trouble. <laughs> in the context of marriage. It's healthy, okay. 
I'm going to keep going. <laughs> Laura's like, land the plane. Come on, change. <laughs> you should have sex often with your spouse. If you don't, that's unhealthy. And if you don't, you need to deal with the problems that are preventing that. Okay, I'm going to keep going. All right. <laughs> God comes to Adam and Eve, naked, unashamed, unhindered, running through the Garden of Eden, naked and fun and free, no sin, no shame, no distance between them, complete intimacy, harmony, unity, got the point, God gives them one rule, one rule, only one rule, super simple, not 100 rules, not 200, one rule, don't eat from this tree, thousands of yes trees, one no tree, just don't eat from this tree, that's all you got to do, all you got to do is just don't eat from this one tree, got it? They both eat the fruit. Serpent comes along, tempts them. Eve takes it, she eats the fruit. Adam takes it, he eats it. Now that they've, now that they've sinned, now they're, sh- now they're filled with shame and they're hiding. Okay, they're hiding. Hiding in the garden. They're hiding in the garden, they're hiding from God, but you know what's so amazing is that God came looking for them. Listen to me. Hey, I know you blew it, but God's looking for you. Not to put you over his lap, but to love you and to embrace you and to offer you forgiveness. God goes to Adam. God goes to Adam and God God goes, hey Adam, where are you? And he's like, I'm hiding. He's like, why are you hiding? Did Did you eat from the tree that I told you not to eat from? And Adam says, yes God, I did. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for what I've done, but I just want you to, I just want you to leave Eve out of this. Okay, Eve did nothing wrong, okay? Is that what he said? That's not what he said. What did, he, what did he say? Here's what he says. God comes to Adam. Hey, Adam, did you eat from the tree I told you not to eat from? You know what he says? The woman. The woman? And then he compounds it. That you put here. <laughs> it's her fault, and God, it's your fault. Was that true? Yes. It just wasn't the whole truth. God goes to Eve. Eve, did you eat the fruit? Yep, sure did. I'm sorry, would you forgive me? Nope, what'd she say? The serpent! Was it true, the serpent? Was there a serpent? Yes. Was it part of the story? Was it true? Yes, but it wasn't the whole truth. See, here's the thing. We want to tell a story that is mostly true, don't we? More, the more painful the event, we want to tell a story that's mostly true. And after you tell the story that is 90% true long enough, then you start to believe it's the whole truth. The whole truth. Because as long as there is someone or something to blame, then there is nothing to change And then you will sabotage and I will sabotage my future because I didn't pause long enough to own my junk. And so therefore, I will sabotage the next relationship and I will sabotage the next thing because I didn't pause long enough and have the courage enough to look at my junk. Instead, I'm telling a story that's 90% true. And I didn't own my 10% of it. Because here's why I don't want to do that. I don't want to own my part because here's what I want to do. I want to say it's 90% their fault. Because then I don't have to take ownership for my part. I want to say it's their fault. Oh yeah, what's your part? Mm -mm. I didn't do it, they did it. Adam and Eve. Here's the problem with that. If you are not honest about what went down in your part, you will continue to sabotage your future. To move forward and for things to be different, you have to be honest to own your junk and it is the last thing we ever want to do because we are terrified to be honest and look at that 10% because it's a a whole different narrative to say it was all them 
Because then if I say, well, yeah, well, I did this and I did this, now I can't frame that story the way I want to frame that story. Listen to me, your life's, way too, your life's way too important to continue to drag around all the junk and the hurt from your past. And God doesn't want you to live that way anymore. There is freedom to be found. You don't have to live another day carrying that lie and that anchor and God is not happy with you. God doesn't want you to suffer with that anymore. Let me give you a story. There was, a, there was an old guy There's an old guy that's, this is back in the horse and buggy days, and, and this old guy is, is walking along, and he's got this giant backpack on. He's got this huge backpack on, and, and this old guy, man, he is just, he is so weary, okay? This, this old guy's been walking a really long ways, and, and he's so weary from the, the long journey that he's been walking. And this guy pulls up next to him with this wagon, pulled by a horse. This guy pulls up to him and says, hey, friend, Hey, friend, do you want to ride? The guy says, man, thank you so much. Man, I've been lugging this backpack, and I'm so tired from this long journey. Man, I'd love, I'd love a ride. And the guy says, go ahead, get in the wagon. Come on, come on, just jump. The guy gets in the wagon, and he stands up next and grabs the rail behind the guy that's driving. But he kept his backpack on. And the guy driving the, back, driving the wagon looks at him and says, hey, hey, you don't have to carry that backpack anymore. Just, just lay it down. Just lay down that backpack. You don't have to carry that backpack anymore. And here's what the guy said. He said, man, I'm just so appreciative of you giving me a ride. I'm so appreciative for what you've done. But I just couldn't imagine you carrying my backpack as well. So therefore, I'm going to continue to carry it. You listen to that story and you say, that's ridiculous, right? In our family, that we would say, that's bad logic, okay? That's often in our conversation, dinner table. That's bad logic, bad logic. And that's what Jesus did for you the day that he died on the cross and he suffered and he gave his life for you. Jesus doesn't want you to carry your past. He doesn't want you to carry your sin. He doesn't want you to carry your shame. There is no glory. You don't have to continue to keep that junk in your backpack another day. You can cut the cord. You don't have to carry that anymore. God doesn't want you to carry that anymore. He wants you to look at it and he wants you to own it and he wants you to acknowledge it, but he doesn't want you to carry that sin. He doesn't want you to carry that because you have a race to run. Are you sitting on the sidelines? You have gifts and abilities and talents and God wants you to run your race, but you can't run your race while you're carrying a huge old anchor over your shoulder called your past. So let me ask you a question with heads bowed. Would you do me a favor? Would you just bow your heads? What do you need to let go of? Sitting next to you is a, is a three by five card and a pen. I'm gonna ask you to pick that up. Pick up the three by five card and a pen. Let me ask you a question. What are you carrying that you need to lay at the foot of the cross? What are you carrying that you need to let go of? I'm gonna ask you to write it down. I'm gonna ask you to own it. I'm gonna ask you to have the courage to write now. Right now, you're carrying stuff from your past and Jesus, you need to release it to Jesus. So would you take that piece of paper, write it out, and then would you lay it at the foot of the cross? Yeah, someone might see me. Yep, they sure will. But you're gonna have the courage to lead the charge. What do you need to release? And would you lay it at the foot of the cross? So I'm gonna ask you to take a moment and write down a few things. Don't put your name on it unless you want to. Don't put your name on it. Just write down a few things that right now the Holy Spirit is working in your heart that you need to release this. I'm still carrying this from my past. I have, I still feel shame every time this topic comes up. I still feel guilt every time this comes up. I, I need to release this. What do you need to release at the foot of the cross? I'm gonna ask you to fill out, put a few things on there, and then get up from your seat in front of all of us, and I'm gonna ask you to lay it at the foot of the cross. And we're gonna spend a few minutes doing that right now. And then we're gonna continue.
Jesus is the only one that can deal with your past. Jesus is the healer of our souls. He wants to set you free. He's not angry at you. He wants to set you free. So will you release it at the foot of the cross? Before coming to know Jesus was good. Um, my family was, most of my family was raised in a Christian home. So um, it just kind of came natural. I came to know him um, just from reading the Bible and one day I went forward and accepted him. And yeah, just my relationship with him and praying. My life after accepting him, um, has, uh, I felt a lot more value in what I do and I feel like I've been a lot nicer to others. Um, and ever since I moved here, um, moving here, sorry, was um, stressful. And I just prayed about that and asked him to help me. Christian home so like we we read the Bible we prayed we did all that so life was life was kind of great so when we moved here um, like it was like so stressful and like just like everything was like I mean it was kind of like chaos since we were moving across the United States so we kind of like stopped going to church for a little we stopped like doing all that um, just because it was like difficult so I kind of like me and Noah kind of like fell away for like a while. But then we, when we like kind of settled here, well, we found this church. <laughs> and yeah, I haven't went forward, but I have asked, I have like done it like personally, not in front of people. Uh, I talked about it, well, one day I, I like discussed it with my parents. I kind of like asked them like a bunch of questions like, Kind of like what do I what do I need to know? And I, I remember like that night I just like I prayed about it and I like I basically just like asked Jesus to like I don't know save me I guess. Since coming to know Jesus, um, I don't I like I felt like like a weight's been lifted off my shoulders. Like I don't know it's just like I feel more like confident. I'm happy. I have a lot of friends. Um, more outgoing, I don't know, just like, life's been great. responsibility for my happiness and doing everything. Um, we didn't grow up or live with any sort of sense of community, so that was a new concept to me. And finally, when it got to a point in the life where I couldn't do it by myself anymore, um, the 
smartest person I know said, why don't we go to church? Um, that was him. <laughs> and we went to church and the entire sermon that day was talking about community and meeting each other and not trying to do everything by yourself and trusting that Jesus will give us that feeling of fullness and that feeling of love that I was striving to find and everything else. Um, and that was when I asked Jesus to come into my life and be my Lord and Savior and take that off of my shoulders and life sense has been a lot less heavy, <laughs> um, a lot more happy. Um, more filled with love. Yeah, I think, yeah, same for me. <laughs> How about you, buddy? What was life like before Jesus? It didn't feel more valued than it does now. Yeah? Like, it didn't feel special, sort of. And that's how you feel now? Yeah. Valued and special? Mm-hmm. Before I came to know Jesus, it was different. Like, I didn't have anybody to talk to. Then Andrew, when he started discipling me. It's been different because I've had somebody to talk to about stuff that I don't really talk to anybody else about. Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and rose back again in three days. 
Because I believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and that I believe this promise, which is forgiveness. Yeah, I have. I feel like I've been progressing in Jesus' way. This is my youngest grandson, and I get the opportunity of baptizing him. Case Nickel. Have you talked to Jesus Christ as a Savior? Isn't that so exciting? Uh, all these people were, were baptized because they trusted Jesus because someone actually told them about Jesus. Here's my question to you. Who's going to be baptized? Because you told them about Jesus. In fact, if you lead someone to Jesus, you can baptize them. So here's the, my question to you, my challenge to you. Who, will be, who, can you gonna, who are you going to baptize because you've actually led somebody to Jesus. They realized they were dead, now they're alive, they were lost, now they're found, and now their sins are washed away and they're forgiven. So church, that's what we're here for, to see more and more people know our good God, to find freedom, to discover their God-given purpose. And let's go reach this city. Let's make a difference. Let's close on one final song. Absolutely. Ten baptisms. Yes. Stand your feet this morning. For God so loved 